want to introduce a very special man. He is delivering the keynote speech tonight. He is a prolific Nigerian entrepreneur, the founder of Conga.com. Yep. Max, tell us, what is Conga.com? Yes, yeah, so Conga.com is the foremost e-commerce uh, e site in Africa. Um, it is better known or often referred to as Africa's answer to Amazon. It is a platform that allows Nigerians and West Africans across the region to conveniently sell and purchase goods online. And prior to founding uh, Conga.com, he spearheaded some of Google's early market entry efforts into Africa. He also has significant experience in, fi in the finance sector, having previously served as vice president of Rand Merchant Bank in West Africa, leading project financing and financial, financial advisory services. That's right, and he has been showered with numerous accolades, including being named as one of Africa's 10 most powerful men in 2014. He has an MBA from the Harvard Business School, and he studied engineering at Dartmouth College and George, George Washington University in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce to the stage Mr. Sim Shagaya. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, talking to old people is easy. Talking to young people makes me nervous, so you're going to have to bear with me here. It's, it's a real privilege to be here uh, amongst all of you and seeing old friends, people that I haven't seen in a few years. Um, I remember many years ago when um, bricks were being sold to raise money to start this institution and to see it here now. It's just so amazing, and to be here with Josh and the rest of the ALA team, well done, you've done such an amazing uh, job. And um, I, I think of the average age of, um, of, of these young people sitting here, and about the time I was your age, I was, uh, I, I think I was in graduate school, I was at Dartmouth at the time, thinking about coming back to the continent to start a, a paging business. Now, you guys probably don't know what pagers are, um, you know, there are these things where you send a phone number to somebody on a little device and then you call them back on that phone number. And I was convinced this was going to revolutionize Africa and I'm really grateful that idea didn't take off. <laughs> um, but what I did not have that you have today is this incredible support network. Um, this consciousness of Pan-Africanism that has been born. Um, I'm so proud to be a part of it today. We, we literally didn't have that when we were your age. Um, it seems like a lot hasn't changed on the continent, but the truth is that we've come so far. And this institution and you being here from all these different countries, I think, represents that. Um, so I'm really, really privileged to be here today. And in a few minutes, we're going to, you know, declare uh, a winner, uh, the top three winners. And 17 folks will technically not be winners, but it's cliche, but really you're all winners in, in my eyes. So I should say that, first of all, you represent the best of us. Uh, the very best of our dreams and aspirations. But, I mean, I think, uh, and I'm not sure I'm even the best, best person to talk about this today. I've chatted with a couple of the team members from ALA, and I've been impressed by how profound our discussions have been about Africa and about our future and about the challenges that we face. So all I'm going to do is sort of have a conversation about the things that, uh, if you like, have sort of concerned me over the past few years. And in all of those anxieties that I have, the solution to all of those problems and challenges ultimately always come back to the young people will fix these things. Um, and so let's talk about them, because the truth is that I don't think that there has ever been a generation um, that faces challenges as profound and great as your generation. Um, you're facing challenges that even we do not face. In many ways, we'll be looking to you to lead us through some of these challenges. Uh, a lot of talk has been made about this whole idea of this fourth industrial revolution. So I'll just sort of squeeze probably one week's of discussion into 10 seconds. So we have the first revolution, right? You guys familiar with this concept? You had the first revolution. It was, you know, uh, steam engines and, and things like that. And then we had the second one was electricity and assembly lines. And then computing came. And incidentally, Africa really didn't truly get through the second and the third. And now we're facing this massive shift, this fourth industrial revolution that threatens to upend everything we know about everything. 
from the way societies are organized to the way marriages and families are structured to what it means to be African and even our place in the world. But it also promises great opportunity. And one of the concerns that I have is that, one of the fears I have is that we're not participating in that revolution. And one of my greatest hopes for folks like you is that you will show us the way into this revolution. Uh, you know, right now, for example, um, uh, an organization I think is called Target Malaria is releasing uh, a new flavor of mosquitoes in Burkina Faso. I don't know if anybody has heard about this. Now, these are mosquitoes that are engineered by this tool called CRISPR to specifically not be able to carry malaria. And they intend to inject these mosquitoes into the environment in, in Botswana. And hopefully, over the course of a few generations, all the mosquitoes within a locale in, sorry, in, Burkina, Faso, in Burkina Faso will not be able to transmit malaria. But in all of the conversations, in all my readings about this great effort, and it's really honorable, I have not really heard the African voice. We're not really part of that discussion. Even right now, therapies that target things like not just malaria, diabetes, and cancer, and some of these things that touch all of our families are being developed. Drugs that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars are being developed. But we're not part of that conversation. What would that mean for us? Just at the time when our population is exploding, and this incidentally is a third sort of challenge, and I'll talk about that in a second, we're being faced with a world where robots will be able to farm for us. The drones will be able to do our security. And what does this mean for jobs in Africa? What does this mean for joblessness in Africa? And I think, on the one hand, it's the job of governments to try and figure out what this means. But on the other hand, it's your job as entrepreneurs, I think even more than the governments, to figure out what this means for us. These are going to be great, great change, um, changes and challenges coming. And this is not, I'm not talking about, it's literally not even 10 years or 20 years anymore. We're not talking about the next three years, five years. We're even talking about now. And, but the thing about these technologies that sort of, uh, in a composite, make this fourth industrial revolution, is that they also create great opportunity for you. I've walked around some of the stands, and I've seen some of you harnessing these tools. And these tools will become even more available to you as we go on. And that leads me to the second challenge. Some of you that are given these opportunities through LA, ALA, through being here today, will probably be able to accumulate incredible wealth in your lifetimes. You will make probably more money than you dream of, just as, you know, recently I've been involved in agriculture, so I find myself spending a lot of time in the rural parts of Nigeria, where you see real, real want and real desperation. And so you have to ask yourself what you do with all of this world. Some of us that were born in the 70s, you know, we've seen the world go from this classic worldview where governments try to do everything. You guys probably don't remember this world. The government of Nigeria, for example, tried to fly airlines. We tried to uh, deploy telecom networks. We tried to do everything. Television back then, media, not even television, started at noon and cartoons played for three hours. And then, you know, you ended the day at 11 with the national anthem. Um, but that world has changed completely today, hasn't it? Um, and then we went to this world where it's freewheeling capitalism and it's money, 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 and let's make cash. And we're seeing a, a world where one individual can accumulate cash that's the equivalent of the GDP of a dozen African countries. And what does this mean for us? I'll tell you from my personal experience, is that money doesn't satisfy. And I think even personally, I have seen, um, as societies, we're starting to see that there must be something deeper than capitalism, than the accumulation of wealth, at least in my own opinion. And I'll tell you something else as entrepreneurs, that something else must drive you beyond money. If it is only money, you will tire. If it is only money, you will give up and you will stop. There must be something deeper that drives us here forward. And so I'm really impressed to see that there's such a big social component to everything that you are doing. That's very important to us. As a matter of fact, I think that if you focus strictly on the monetary objective, you compromise the mission. Money comes as a necessary consequence of adding value to society. So everything that you do must be with Africa in mind in terms of adding value to society. The third challenge you face and you guys in some ways constitute the challenge itself, is that I was born, I was born in 1975, which there was a time that seemed like 
recently, but now even when I say it, it seems not so recent. But I was born into a Nigeria with 66 million people and an Africa of 400 million people. And today Nigeria is 200 million people and Africa is 1.3 billion people. And by 2050, I think we're hearing Nigeria is going to be 400 million people and Africa is going to be 2.4 billion people, right? Even right now, Nigeria is half of the population of Africa when I was born. So there's this massive base of people, this massive demographic that's coming that could constitute a blessing or it could be a challenge. And you guys must lead. When, we, when people like me in our humble contributions to LA and even being here, the reason I'm here is to give you that message is that you must lead. We've already started to see some of the symptoms of the lack of that leadership or not paying attention to our demographics in even my own dear country in Nigeria. Make no mistake, Boko Haram is no more than a symptom of demographic explosion and climate change. That's all it is. So if we don't manage this, there will be more Boko Harams. Do not point a finger at Nigeria and laugh. These things can happen anywhere. And this population explosion is happening everywhere. These are the three challenges I think that you must fundamentally face. And even as I enter my 40s, and I'm beginning to get deep into my 40s, I know that I must cede leadership to you people. You understand the world in a way that I don't. All I can do is offer you some advice in my own journey of entrepreneurship. You must push. It can't all be about money. The very society that you seek to help and develop will at times seem to fight against you. The very system that you think you want to improve will sometimes oppose you. You will have high highs, you will laugh, you will be joyous and dance, and then you will have moments of despair where you'll be alone in your room and not have anybody to talk to. If you're so fortunate that the ideas that you've so you know, wonderfully pr uh, presented to us today is your first idea, is, is the idea, then that's great. But the truth of the matter is that you have many iterations. You will find new things to work on as you go on. What I will tell you is that I salute your effort. Like I said, you represent the very best of us. I honestly believe this. Just as your blood is the composite of all of your ancestors' blood, all of us are looking to you. I really think this is a special time in the, in the history of the continent. Your generation will be the ones that faces the fork in the road. The wave crests with you. There is no other, the, the wave doesn't go higher than you. There is no other fork in the road beyond you. So harness your ambition. And it will take pharaohic ambition to fix this place. We will rely on you even more than we rely on governments. Already, entrepreneurs have more credibility than politicians. I think we all believe this, right? We believe in you more than we do the politicians. So we look to you. You will also need a certain level of pan-African cooperation that I'm so proud, I think is even more tangible here. It's to be felt more readily here than in the hallways of the Africa Union in Addis Ababa. You will need that. We didn't have that at your age. It's so fantastic to see that here. For some of us, like you know, my brother Chris, for some of us to meet each other, we had to go abroad. Now we are here, and I'm seeing Libyans, and I'm seeing Moroccans, I'm seeing Nigerians, I'm seeing Zimbabweans here. And that's a wonderful thing. So you have a lot of work to do. Face it with sobriety, but be excited about the future. There will be challenges. And whatever little help some of us can give, we will give. At the end of the day, you know, um, Josh likes to say I mentored him. I'm not exactly sure what that means because at the time I was supposedly mentoring him, uh, I was trying to figure it out myself. So, um, you know, for whatever it's worth, we are here to offer every help. But again, I will say this. I think I've repeated this a few times. It's a recurrent theme. Is you literally represent the best of us. And with that comes an awful lot of responsibility. So face it with sobriety, face it with focus, and we're here for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.